Hello, and welcome to another episode of Movie Spoiler Alert. Today we will be summarizing all 17 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films from 2008 up until now to get you ready for Avengers Infinity War. The only summary that I don't have here is for the Black Panther, as it's currently not out on Blu-ray, so I can't use it for summary purposes. I am releasing this video in two different versions, one that's in chronological order based off of the year that the film was released, and another organized by the title characters. A link for both, as well as for the individual spoilers, will be in the cards above. We also are doing giveaways now on Instagram, so make sure to check out at the end of the video to find more details. So let's get started. Today we're talking about the 2008 superhero film Iron Man, so let's get started. The film opens with genius, billionaire, and playboy Tony Stark, owner of Stark Industries, a weapons company, and his friend Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes, demonstrating a new Jericho missile. The demonstration is ambushed and Stark is wounded and captured by a terrorist group, the Ten Rings. Another prisoner, Yinsen, grabs an electromagnet into Tony's chest to keep shrapnel shards from reaching his heart. The two prisoners refuse to build the Jericho missile in exchange for freedom, and instead build an arc reactor power source and a suit of armor to escape. Their plans are discovered, and Yinsen sacrifices himself while the suit is completed. Stark battles his way out of the cave, burns the terrorist weapons, and crashes in the desert, destroying the suit. After being rescued by Rhodes, Stark announces that his company will no longer manufacture weapons. Obadiah Stane, his father's old partner and the company's manager, advises Stark against this. In his home workshop, Stark builds a sleeker, more powerful version of the armor suit, as well as a more powerful arc reactor for his chest. Stark is then informed that his company's weapons were delivered to Ten Rings and are being used to attack Yinsen's home village. Stark also learns Dane is trying to replace him as head of the company. Stark uses his new armor and saves the villagers. While flying home, Stark is shot by fighter jets. He reveals his secret identity to Rhodes to end the attack. Meanwhile, Ten Rings gather the prototype suit and meet with Stane, who has the group executed. Stane has a massive new suit engineered from the wreckage. Stark sends his assistant, Pepper Potts, to hack into Stane's computer. She discovers Stane's has been supplying the terrorists and hired them to kill Stark at the beginning of the film. Potts meets with Agent Phil Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D. to inform him of Stane's activities. Stane's scientists cannot duplicate Stark's arc reactor, so Stane confronts Stark at his home and takes the one from his chest. Stark replaces it with his original reactor. Potts and S.H.I.E.L.D. agents attempt to arrest Stane, but he uses the suit and attacks them. Stark fights Stane, but is outmatched without his new reactor. The fight carries Stark and Stane to the top of the Stark Industry building, and Stark instructs Potts to overload the large arc reactor powering the building. This unleashes a massive electrical surge that causes Stain and his armor to fall into the exploding reactor, killing him. The next day at a press conference, Stark publicly admits to being the superhero Iron Man. In a post credit scene, S.H.I.E.L.D. director Nick Fury visits Stark at his home wanting to discuss the Avenger Initiative. The film opens in Russia with a man named Ivan Vanko seeing the revelation of Tony Stark as Iron Man who begins building his own miniature arc reactor. We then transition to six months later where we see Tony Stark is using his Iron Man suit for peaceful means, refusing to sell his designs. The palladium core of Stark's arc reactor however is slowly poisoning him which is causing him to begin to fear death. Stark makes Pepper Potts the CEO of Stark Industries and hires Natalie Rushman as his new personal assistant. While competing in the Monaco Historic Grand Prix, Stark is attacked by Vanko, who has electric whips powered by his own arc reactor. Stark dons his new Mark V suit, defeats Vanko, but the suit is damaged. Vanko states that he wanted to prove that Iron Man is not invincible. After seeing the fight, Stark's rival, Justin Hammer, helps break Vanko out of prison to have him build him a line of suits to beat Stark. While at what he believes to be his final birthday, Tony gets drunk while wearing the Iron Man suit. Tony's friend, Lieutenant James Rhodes, played by a different actor than the first film, puts on a suit and tries to restrain Tony. Rhodes later takes the suit for the purpose of the Air Force. Nick Fury, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., approaches Stark revealing that his assistant is actually Natasha Romanoff, aka Black Widow, and that Tony's father, Howard Stark, was one of the founders of S.H.I.E.L.D. and that Fury knew him personally. 
Fury explains that Vanko's father worked with Howard Stark to invent the arc reactor, but when Vanko's father wanted to sell it for profit, Howard Stark had him deported and was sent to prison, thus Vanko's vendetta with Tony. Fury gives Stark some of his father's old materials, including plans for a new reactor. With the help of his computer Jarvis, Stark is able to make a new reactor, one that replaces the one that is poisoning him. At a weapons expo, Hammer unveils Vanko's drones, led by Lieutenant Rhodes in a heavily weaponized Iron Man suit. Stark arrives later in his Mark VI armor to warn Rhodes, but Vanko takes control of both the drones and Rhodes' armor and attacks Iron Man. Hammer is arrested, and Romanoff and Stark's bodyguard Happy go after Vanko within Hammer's factory. Vanko escapes, but Rhodes regains control of his suit. Together, Rhodes and Stark defeat Vanko and his drones. Vanko seems to commit suicide by blowing up his suit. After a debriefing, Fury informs Stark that because of Stark's difficult personality, they would only use Stark as a consultant, not as a member of S.H.I.E.L.D. Stark and Rhodes receive medals for their heroism. In a post credit scene, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Phil Coulson reports that the discovery of a large hammer at the bottom of a crater, hinting at the hammer of Thor. The film opens with Tony Stark remembering a New Year's Eve party in 1999, where he met scientist Maya Hansen, the inventor of Extremis, an experimental regenerative treatment which would allow recovery from crippling injuries. Disabled scientist Aldrich Killian offers them a place in his company, Advanced Idea Mechanics, but Stark rejects the offer, humiliating Killian. Many years later, six months after the events of the first Avengers film, Stark is suffering panic attacks based on alien invasions. Meanwhile, a string of bombings occurs from a terrorist known as the Mandarin. Stark's security chief, Happy, is badly injured in an attack, which causes Stark to issue a threat to the Mandarin, who responds by destroying Stark's home with helicopter gunships. Maya Hansen, who came to warn Stark, who survives, along with Stark and his girlfriend and CEO of Stark Industries, Pepper Potts. Stark begins to investigate in order to find the Mandarin. With the help of a young boy named Harley, Stark discovers that the bombings were actually caused by jaded veterans exposed to Extremis, which causes some of the subjects to explode. These explosions are being used to cover up the flaws with Extremis. Aldrich Killian has been manipulating intelligence agencies to lure Lieutenant Rhodes, the former war machine, now known as the Iron Patriot, in order to steal his armor. Harley helps Stark track down the Mandarin to Miami and infiltrates his headquarters. Stark realizes, however, that the Mandarin is actually an actor who is hired to play a character and has no idea that the recordings he's been making have been used to show him as a terrorist. Killian reveals that he is truly the Mandarin, and he has been using the Extremist Project to cure himself and other veterans. Stark is captured, and Killian injects Pepper with the Extremist formula in order to get Stark to fix Extremist's flaws and also to save Pepper. Hansen has a change of heart and tries to stop Killian. However, Killian ends up killing her. Stark escapes and reunites with Rhodes, discovering that Killian intends to attack the President on Air Force One. Stark saves some of the passengers and crew, but the President is captured, and Killian plans to kill him live on television. The Vice President will become the Puppet President, as Killian says he will cure the Vice President's daughter's disability. Killian is traced to a damaged oil tanker, and Stark goes to save Pepper, while Rhodes saves the President. Stark summons drone Iron Man suits to provide air support to Rhodes as he transports the President. Stark discovers that Pepper did survive the Extremis procedure, but the oil rig begins to collapse, and she falls to what seems like her death. Stark confronts Killian and traps him in an Iron Man suit, sets it to self-destruct, but it fails to kill Killian. Pepper, who survived the fall due to her Extremis powers, intervenes and is able to kill Killian. Stark has Jarvis remotely destroy all of his Iron Man suits as a sign of devotion to Pepper, and the Vice President and the actor pretending to be the Mandarin are both arrested. Stark is able to stabilize Pepper's extremist effects, and Stark has the shrapnel near his heart removed. He throws his now obsolete arc reactor into the sea, saying that he will always be the Iron Man. In a post credit scene, we see Stark waking up Dr. Bruce Banner, aka the Hulk. Today we're talking about the 2008 superhero film, The Incredible Hulk. An important thing to note is that there was a 2003 movie called The Hulk, which was not part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which this film actually is. Also, Edward Norton plays Bruce Banner in this film, however, Mark Ruffalo plays Banner in all the subsequent Marvel films. 
The film opens at Culver University, where General Thunderbolt Ross meets with Dr. Bruce Banner, the colleague and boyfriend of his daughter Betty, to discuss an experiment that Ross claims is meant to make humans immune to gamma radiation. The experiment fails, and the gamma radiation causes Banner to turn into the giant green hulk whenever he becomes angry, enraged, or excited. The hulk destroys the lab, injuring and killing several people inside. Banner becomes a fugitive, and the U.S. military and General Ross want to weaponize the Hulk process. Five years later, Banner works at a bottling facility in Brazil while searching for a cure for the Hulk condition, collaborating online with a man known only as Mr. Blue. Banner uses yoga techniques to try to keep his rage under control and hasn't transformed in five months. After cutting his finger on the line and some blood falling into a bottle, an elderly man gets gamma sickness from drinking a bottle in Wisconsin. Ross uses that bottle to track down Banner, sending in a SWAT team led by Emil Blonsky to capture Banner. Banner becomes the Hulk and defeats the team. Blonsky agrees to be injected with a small amount of a similar serum to Banner's, which gives him enhanced abilities, but deforms his skeleton and impairs his judgment. Banner returns to Culver University and reunites with Betty, who is now dating psychiatrist Leonard Sampson. Banner is attacked again by Blonsky's team after Sampson gave him up, causing him to become the Hulk. A battle takes place outside the university, and Blonsky seems to be killed by the Hulk, who escapes with Betty. After becoming Banner, Betty and him go on the run, and Banner contacts Mr. Blue, who they meet in New York City. Mr. Blue is actually cellular biologist Dr. Samuel Stearns, who tells Banner that he possibly has an antidote, but it only works after each individual transformation, and it is not permanent. Stern, however, has synthesized a large amount of Banner's blood in hopes of using it for medical purposes, but Banner fears the military will use it and wants to destroy the blood supply. Meanwhile, Blonsky is revealed to have survived the battle and is completely healed. They try for a third time to capture Banner and are successful and take Betty too. Blonsky orders Stern to inject him with Banner's blood, which Stearns warns him will cause him to become an abomination, but Blonsky insists. This causes Blonsky to become a creature much larger and stronger than the Hulk, but absolutely insane. Blonsky, aka Abomination, attacks Stearns, causing him to get some of Banner's blood into a cut on his forehead, causing Stern to transform as well. This is a reference to the comic book character, The Leader. Abomination rampages through Harlem, and Banner is able to convince Ross to release him, as the Hulk is the only one who can defeat the Abomination. After a large battle, Blonsky is defeated. After a nice moment with Betty, the Hulk flees New York. Months later, Banner is in British Columbia, now able to transform into the Hulk in a controlled manner. In a local bar, we see Tony Stark approaching Ross, telling him that he is putting a team together. Today we're talking about the 2011 superhero film, Thor. So let's get started. The film opens in 1965 AD, where Odin, the king of Asgard, is waging war against the frost giants and their leader Lofi to prevent them from conquering the Nine Realms. The Asgardian warriors defeat the frost giants and seize their source of power. The film transitions to the present, where Odin's son, Thor, is preparing to take over the throne of Asgard, but is interrupted when frost giants attempt to retrieve their power source. Against Odin's order, Thor travels to confront Lofi, accompanied by his brother Loki, childhood friend Sith, and the Warriors Three. Odin must intervene, and the fragile truce between the races is destroyed. Odin strips Thor of his powers and exiles him to Earth as a mortal, accompanied by his hammer Mjolnir, now protected by an enchantment that allows only the worthy to lift it. Thor lands in New Mexico, where Dr. Jane Foster, Darcy Lewis, and Dr. Eric Selvig find him. SHIELD agent Phil Coulson commandeers the hammer. Thor attempts to retrieve it, but he finds himself unable to lift it. He accepts his exile on Earth and develops a romance with Jane. Meanwhile, Loki discovers that he's Lofi's son, adopted by Odin after the war ended. Loki seizes the throne while Odin is in a deep sleep and offers Lofi the chance to kill Odin. Sif and the Warriors Three attempt to return Thor from exile. Loki sends a massive warrior called the Destroyer to pursue them. The Destroyer attacks and defeats the Warriors, prompting Thor to offer himself instead. Thor's sacrifice proves him worthy to wield Mjolnir. The hammer returns to him, restoring his powers and enabling him to defeat the Destroyer. Kissing Jane goodbye and vowing to return, he and his fellow Asgardians leave to confront Loki. Loki betrays and kills Lofi, revealing his true plan was to destroy the Frost Giant's world, to prove himself worthy to Odin. 
Thor arrives to stop Loki's plan and ends up stranding himself in Asgard. Odin awakens and refuses to give Loki approval, prompting him to fall into an abyss. On Earth, Jane and her team search for a way to open a portal to Asgard. In a post credit scene, Nick Fury asks Selvig to study a mysterious cube-shaped object. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Movie Spoiler Alerts. Today we're talking about the 2013 superhero film, Thor, The Dark World. So let's get started. In the past, Bor, father of Odin, clashes with the dark elf Malkif, who seeks to unleash a weapon known as the Aether on the Nine Realms. After conquering his forces, Bor safeguards the Aether within a stone column. Unknown to Bor, Malkif and a handful of dark elves escape into suspended animation. In present-day Asgard, Loki is imprisoned for his war crimes on Earth. The Asgardians learn that the Convergence, a rare alignment of the Nine Realms, is imminent, and portals linking the worlds appear at random. In London, Dr. Jane Foster and Darcy Lewis travel to an abandoned factory where such portals have appeared. Jane is teleported into another world where she is infected by the Aether. Thor brings her to Asgard, where Odin warns that the Aether heralds a catastrophic prophecy. Malkith, awakened by the Aether's release, attacks Asgard. Thor's mother Frigga is killed protecting Jane, and the Dark Elves flee. Thor enlists the help of Loki to use a portal to confront Malkith. As Malkith draws the Aether out of Jane, Thor attempts to destroy it, but fails. Malkith merges with the Aether and leaves. Loki is fatally wounded. Thor and Jane discover a portal in a nearby cave and reunite in London with Darcy and Dr. Eric Selvig. They learn that Malkith's plan is to restore the Dark Elves. Thor battles Malkith through various portals and across multiple worlds until one portal separates them, leaving Malkith unimposed on Earth. Thor returns in time to help transport Malkith away from Earth, where he is crushed by his own damaged ship. Thor returns to Asgard, where he declines Odin's offer to take the throne and tells Odin of Loki's sacrifice. As he leaves, Odin's form transforms into Loki, who is alive and impersonating Odin. In a mid credit scene, we see the Collector collecting Infinity Stones. It is revealed that the Aether is an Infinity Stone, and Asgard has an Infinity Stone named the Tesseract. In a post credit scene, Jane and Thor reunite on Earth while a frost monster continues to run amok. Two years after the Battle of Sokovia, Thor has been unsuccessfully searching for the Infinity Stones and is now imprisoned by the fire demon Surtur. Surtur reveals that Thor's father Odin is no longer in Asgard and that it will soon be destroyed in the prophesized Ragnarok. Once Surtur unites his crown with the eternal flame that burns in Odin's vault, Thor defeats Surtur and claims his crown, believing that he has prevented Ragnarok. Thor returns to Asgard to find his brother Loki posing as Odin. Thor forces Loki to help him find their father, and with the directions of Doctor Stephen Strange on Earth, they locate Odin in Norway. Odin explains that he is dying, and his passing will allow his firstborn child, Hela, to escape from the prison that she was sealed in long ago. Hela had been the leader of Asgard's army, and conquered the Nine Realms with Odin. But Odin imprisoned her, fearing that she had become too powerful. Odin dies, and Hela is released. She destroys Thor's hammer, and when Loki and Thor attempt to flee through the Bifrost Bridge, she pursues them and forces them out into space. Hela arrives in Asgard, destroying its army and killing its warrior three. She resurrects the ancient dead who once fought with her, including her giant wolf Fenris, and appoints the Asgardian, Scourge, as her executioner. She plans to use the Bifrost to expand Asgard's empire, but Heimdall steals the sword that controls the bridge and hides it away with the rest of the citizens. Thor crash lands on Sakaar, a garbage planet surrounded by wormholes. A slave trader, Scrapper 142, subdues him and sells him as a gladiator to Sakaar's ruler, the Grand Master, with whom Loki has already come to know. Thor recognizes 142 as one of the Valkyrie, a legendary force of female warriors who were killed defending Asgard from Hela a long time ago. Thor is forced to compete in the Grand Master's contest of champions, facing an enraged Hulk. Thor gets the upper hand on Hulk, but the Grand Master sabotages the fight to ensure Hulk's victory. Still enslaved, Thor tries to convince Hulk and 142 to help him save Asgard, but neither are willing. He manages to escape and finds the jet that brought the Hulk to Sakaar. Hulk follows Thor to the jet, 
where a recording of Natasha Romanoff makes him transform into Bruce Banner for the first time since Sokovia. The Grand Master orders 142 and Loki to find Thor and Hulk, but Loki forces her to relive the deaths of her fellow Valkyrie at the hands of Helena. Deciding to help Thor, she takes Loki captive. Unwilling to be left behind, Loki provides the group with the means to steal one of the Grand Master's ships. They then also liberate the other gladiators who start a revolution. Loki attempts to betray his brother again, but Thor anticipates it and leaves him behind. Thor, Banner, and 142 escape through the wormhole to Asgard, where Hela's forces are attacking the citizens for the sword that controls the Bifrost. Banner becomes the Hulk again, fighting Fenris, while Thor and 142 battle Scourge and the resurrected warriors. Loki and the Sakaar gladiators arrive to help, and the Asgardian citizens board their ship. Feeling regretful, Scourge sacrifices himself to allow their escape. Thor, facing Hela, loses his right eye and then has a vision of Odin that helps him realize that only Ragnarok can stop her. While Hela is distracted, Loki locates Surtur's crown and places it into the Eternal Flame. Surtur is reborn and destroys Asgard, seemingly killing Hela. As the film concludes, Thor, the Crown King, decides to take the rest of the Asgardian citizens to Earth. In a mid-credits scene, we see that they are intercepted by a large spacecraft, presumably owned by Thanos. In a post-credits scene, the Grandmaster encounters a group of former subjects who are still rebelling. The film begins in 1942, with Nazi officer Johann Schmidt and his men entering into a German-occupied Norwegian town, looking for a mysterious relic known as the Tesseract, which is said to have untold powers. At the same time, Steve Rogers enlists in the U.S. military, despite his various health and physical problems, with the help of his friend Bucky and Dr. Abraham Erskine. Rogers is put into an experimental super soldier program, and it is revealed that the Nazi officer Schmidt underwent an earlier version of this procedure, having some serious side effects. Rogers undergoes the procedure, becoming significantly more muscular and strong. Back in Europe, Schmidt and Dr. Zola begin to use the power of the Tesseract in order to try to take over the world. Schmidt discovers Dr. Erskine's location and has him assassinated right after he completed Roger's procedure. Roger captures the assassin, but the assassin commits suicide in order to avoid interrogation. With Erskine dead, the super soldier formula is lost. With his new powers, Rogers is sent to tour the nation in a colorful costume given the title Captain America, and is told to promote war bonds. While visiting Italy, Rogers finds out that his friend Bucky's unit went missing in a battle against Schmidt's forces. Rogers teams up with a British agent, Peggy Carter, and the engineer Howard Stark, who, side note, is Tony Stark's, aka Iron Man's, father. Rogers infiltrates the fortress of Schmidt's Hydra organization and frees Bucky and the other prisoners. Rogers battles against Schmidt, who has a red skull-like face underneath his mask, giving him the title, The Red Skull. Schmidt is able to escape, and Rogers returns the soldiers. Rogers and the soldiers attack several known Hydra bases, using advanced equipment supplied by Howard Stark including a circular shield made of vibranium, a nearly indestructible metal. Rogers is able to capture Dr. Zola, but during the capture, Bucky falls from the train and appears to be dead. From Dr. Zola's information, Rogers locates the final Hydra base, and Rogers stops Schmidt aboard a plane from using the Tesseract to cause massive casualties all over the world. The container for the Tesseract is damaged, and Schmidt physically touches the Tesseract, causing him to dissolve into bright light. The Tesseract falls and burns through the floor of the plane into the ocean. Rogers crashes the plane into the Arctic in order to prevent the onboard payload from possibly hurting anyone else. Stark recovers the Tesseract from the ocean floor, and the wreckage and Rogers are unable to be located, so Rogers is presumed dead. Rogers awakens in a 1940s-style hospital room, but soon realizes that something is wrong, and rushes out of the hospital, right into present-day Times Square. The S.H.I.E.L.D. director, Nick Fury, then informs Rogers that he has been asleep for nearly 70 years. In a post credit scene, we see Fury and Rogers discussing possible future missions that will affect the entire world. 
The film takes place two years after the events of the first Avengers film, which, if you haven't seen, check out my summary. Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, is working for the government agency S.H.I.E.L.D. under director Nick Fury. Rogers and agent Natasha Romanoff, aka Black Widow, are sent to save hostages aboard a S.H.I.E.L.D. boat that has been taken over by mercenaries. Rogers discovers that Romanoff has another job, however, to extract data from the ship's computer for Fury. Rogers confronts Fury later about this, where Fury reveals a plan to build three massive helicarriers equipped with advanced weaponry and spy devices to try to preemptively destroy any threat through a project known as Project Insight. Fury, however, is unable to decrypt the recovered data and becomes suspicious of Project Insight. Fury is later ambushed by a group led by a mysterious assassin known as the Winter Soldier. Fury escapes and finds Rogers, telling him that S.H.I.E.L.D. has been compromised. After giving Rogers a flash drive containing some data from the ship, Fury is gunned down by the Winter Soldier. Fury later dies in surgery, and Rogers is called into the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters the next day to try to find out what information he was given. When Rogers refuses to give up the information, however, he is hunted down by a group known as Strike. Rogers meets up with Romanoff, and using the flash drive, they discover a secret S.H.I.E.L.D. bunker, which has a supercomputer containing the preserved consciousness of Dr. Zola, one of HYDRA's leaders from the first film. Dr. Zola reveals that HYDRA has been slowly infiltrating S.H.I.E.L.D., and convincing the world to give up their freedoms for a sense of security, allowing HYDRA to become more and more powerful. A missile is fired at the bunker, which Rogers and Romanoff narrowly escape, and the two realize that Alexander Pierce, S.H.I.E.L.D. senior official, is also HYDRA's leader. Rogers and Romanoff enlist the help of Sam Wilson, aka Falcon. The three find out that Dr. Zola developed an algorithm to identify who might become a future threat to HYDRA, and will use the InSight helicarriers and their massive weapon arsenal to eliminate these threats. The group is ambushed by the Winter Soldier, who Rogers realizes is actually Bucky Barnes, his friend from the first film. Barnes was captured and experimented on after World War II and became the Winter Soldier. The three are brought to a safe house where Nick Fury is, having faked his death, for a plan to sabotage the helicarriers by replacing their computer chips. During an important meeting, Rogers broadcasts Hydra's secret plans to everyone at the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters. Romanoff is able to disarm Pierce, and Fury forces Pierce to unlock the database so they can expose Hydra to the public. Eventually, Fury kills Pierce. Rogers and Wilson storm two helicarriers and replace their control chips, but the Winter Soldier destroys Wilson's flight suit and fights with Rogers aboard the third carrier. Rogers is able to put the new controller into the final ship, and S.H.I.E.L.D. uses this to have the carriers destroy each other. Rogers refuses to fight the Winter Soldier in order to reach out to his longtime friend. The ship they are aboard crashes into the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, and Rogers is thrown into a river, unconscious. The Winter Soldier rescues Rogers and disappears into the woods, showing Rogers did reach out to his old friend Bucky. Rogers and Wilson decide to pursue the Winter Soldier as the film ends, while Fury goes to find the remaining Hydra cells in Eastern Europe. There are two additional scenes during the credits. The first shows Hydra leader Baron Strucker finding an energy-filled scepter, the one that we see Loki use during the Avengers film, as well as two prisoners, one with super speed and one with telekinetic powers. These two are siblings that we see in the Avengers' second film, known as Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch, who are also Magneto's children. The second scene shows the Winter Soldier at a memorial for Bucky Barnes, who the Winter Soldier actually is, at the Smithsonian Institute. The film opens in 1991 with brainwashed soldier Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, being dispatched by Hydra in a base in Siberia to intercept a car carrying a case of Super Soldier Serum, and also killing the vehicle's occupants. The film transitions to present day approximately one year after defeating Ultron in Sokovia. The Avengers are chasing after Brock Rumlow, who stole a biological weapon from a lab in Lagos. After some chasing, Rumlow blows himself up with a suicide vest, and Wanda tries to displace the blast, and ends up destroying a nearby building, killing several Wakandian humanitarians. The Secretary of State informs the Avengers that the UN is preparing to pass the Sokovia Accords, which ideally will make the Avengers overseen by a UN panel. The Avengers are divided on the issue. 
Tony Stark feels that they do need some oversight, especially after he was approached by a mother of a boy who was killed in an attack that the Avengers were involved in. Captain America, however, feels that they will become puppets of the government, and the Avengers should be acting under their own supervision. Some Avengers attend the signing of the Accords in Vienna, which are bombed, and many are killed, including the King of Wakanda. Security footage reveals the bomber to be Bucky Barnes, and the Wakandan prince, T'Challa, vows to kill Bucky. Captain America discovers Bucky's location and tries to bring him in, as they are childhood friends. T'Challa, also known as the Black Panther, also tracks down Bucky, and a massive fight breaks out in Bucharest, and eventually Captain America, Bucky, and the Black Panther are all arrested. A man who is later revealed to be Helmet Zemo, finds Bucky's old Hydra handler, and steals the phrase book that is used to activate Bucky's brainwashing. Zemo is able to get into the facilities where Barnes is held, and recites the words to activate Bucky. He then questions Bucky to find the location of the other brainwashed super soldiers. He sends Bucky on a rampage to try to cover his tracks. A fight breaks out, and eventually Bucky regains his senses. Bucky explains that Zemo was the real bomber in Vienna, and has disguised himself as Bucky. However, the Avengers don't get the approval to track down Zemo, so Falcon, Bucky, and Captain America decide to pursue him, along with the help of Wanda, Hawkeye, and Ant-Man. Stark puts his own team together to recapture Bucky and the Rogue Avengers, with Stark's team consisting of Black Widow, Black Panther, War Machine, Vision, and Spider-Man. A big fight breaks out at an airport, and eventually, Bucky and Captain America are able to escape. The others are captured and sent to jail except Black Widow, and War Machine is paralyzed. Stark finds evidence, however, that Zemo was behind the bombings, and travels to where Bucky and Captain America are heading. They all three arrive where the super soldiers have been in stasis, and discovers that Zemo has shot and killed them all. It is revealed that Zemo's entire family was killed in Sokovia during the events of the second Avengers movie, and he has been plotting to pit all the Avengers against one another so they would destroy each other. This is when Zemo reveals that back in 1991, when Bucky killed the two people to get the super soldier formula, that the two people he killed were Stark's parents. The enraged Stark attacks both Bucky and Captain America, and a big fight breaks out. Bucky loses his arm, and Stark's armor is disabled. Captain America, having defeated Stark, leaves with the injured Bucky, leaving his shield behind. Zemo, satisfied that he broke the Avengers apart, attempts suicide, but is stopped by Black Panther. As the film begins to wrap up, Stark is shown helping War Machine with an exoskeletal leg brace that allows him to walk again. Captain America breaks the captive Avengers out of jail. During a mid credit scene, we see Black Panther has forgiven Bucky, and gives him asylum and puts him into cryostasis until they can reverse his brainwashing. In a post credit scene, we see Spider-Man testing out a new gadget from Stark, with the phrase, Spider-Man will return on screen. Peter Jason Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord Shortly after his mother's death in 1988, he is kidnapped and raised by a group of space pirates known as the Ravengers. The film opens on Peter stealing an orb, which takes place 26 years after his abduction. Peter is a goofy and charismatic smuggler who is a bit of a jerk at times and doesn't have any trouble with the ladies. Remind you of anyone? Yandu. Yandu is the leader of the Ravengers, a group of ruthless space thieves and smugglers. Yandu raised Peter after abducting him, bringing him into the life of space crime. Yandu carries a special arrow on his hip that he can control by simply whistling, working as a very effective and deadly weapon. After hearing that Peter stole the orb in the opening of the movie, Yandu places a bounty on Peter's head in order to steal the orb for himself. Nova Prime Irani Rayal. Nova Prime is the leader of the Nova Corps, the central good guy government seen in the film. The Nova Corps' home planet is Xandar, which is also the same planet where Peter intends to sell the orb that he stole. The Nova Corps is at war with the Kree, which is led by the fanatic Ronan the Accuser. 
Ronan is the main antagonist of the film, and is a member of the Kree race. Ronan is a fanatic who defied the treaty between the Kree and the Nova Empire, and is hellbent on destroying the planet Xandar. Ronan wants the orb so he can trade it to Thanos, in order to receive Thanos' aid in the destruction of Xandar. Ronan's primary weapon is a large hammer, and also has his own ship known as the Dark Aster, and a sizable fleet along with it. Nebula Nebula is the adopted daughter of Thanos, and the adoptive sister of Gamora. She is a cyborg, incapable of repairing herself, and is loyal to Ronin. Gamora Gamora is the adopted daughter of Thanos, and the adoptive sister of Nebula. At the beginning of the film, she is sent by Thanos to aid Ronin, and is tasked with stealing the orb. Gamora decides to betray both her father and Ronin, and plans on stealing the orb for herself to sell to a buyer for an obscene amount of money. Gamora is a skilled and deadly warrior, though Peter does try frequently to flirt with her. Rocket Raccoon and Groot Rocket Raccoon is the result of illegal genetic experimentation, resulting in Rocket being a very intelligent and skilled fighter and is also capable of designing complex weapons and technology. Groot is a tree-like creature who is only capable of saying, I'm Groot. I'm Groot. I am Groot! Together, Rocket and Groot work as bounty hunters and try to catch Peter for the reward that Yondu put on his head. Drax the Destroyer. Drax is an incredibly powerful and strong fighter, but he is completely literal and has no understanding of euphemisms, social cues, or satire. Drax's entire family was killed by Ronan and vows to get revenge. And now on to the story. After stealing the orb, Peter lands on the planet Xander in order to sell the orb to his black market dealer. Shortly after arriving, Peter is intercepted by Gamora who wants to steal the orb for herself. Peter and Gamora break into a fight when Groot and Rocket identify Peter and notice that he has a bounty on his head. Groot and Rocket jump into the fight in order to capture Peter themselves. After causing a considerable amount of damage, all four of them are arrested and sent to the Klin, a high security outer space prison. When they arrive at the Klin, Gamora explains to the group that she was going to sell the orb for a massive amount of money. After a bit of arguing, Peter convinces the team to work together to break out of the prison and split the earnings from selling the orb. While in prison, they meet Drax, whose entire family was killed by Ronan and wants revenge. Drax teams up with the main group in hopes that he will have the opportunity to kill Ronan. The team devises an elaborate plan involving disabling the gravity of the prison and successfully escapes. Afterwards, they travel to meet Gamora's buyer on a massive floating head known as Nowhere. Nowhere is a seedy mining community with virtually no laws. Peter and Gamora meet up with the Collector there, who reveals to them the true purpose of the orb. Oh, my new friends. Before creation itself, there were six singularities. Then the universe exploded into existence and the remnants of these systems were forged into concentrated ingots. Infinity Stone. The Infinity Stone contains a massive amount of energy and can only be wielded by beings of superior power. However, one of the slaves tries to take the stone in defiance of him and explodes on contact. After realizing the stone's importance, Gamora and Peter decide to take the stone to the Nova Corps so it could be kept out of the hands of dangerous individuals such as Ronan. But while Peter and Gamora were dealing with the stone and the Collector, Drax made contact with Ronan in a foolish attempt to kill him. Ronan arrives on nowhere with his entire fleet, and at the same time, Yondu has tracked down Peter's location and a huge fight breaks out between all three sides. After a lot of shooting, flying, and chasing, eventually the team is defeated and they lose the stone to Ronan. Gamora and Peter are left stranded floating in outer space with only seconds to live. In a moment of desperation, Peter reaches out to Yondu, who ends up saving them from the cold and oxygenless space. Aboard the Dark Aster, Ronan, 
who has now realized what the orb actually contained, decides to take the Infinity Stone for himself and places it into his hammer. Thanos is furious at Ronan's betrayal, but Ronan vows that he will destroy the planet Xander, and afterwards he will go kill Thanos. We now go back to Yandu's ship, where shortly after recovering from the oxygenless space, Peter and Gamora are interrogated by Yandu. After some threatening and fighting, Peter convinces Yandu and the Ravengers to team up with the Guardians in order to get the stone back from Ronan. The deal is Yandu and his men will help the Guardians, so long as Yandu gets the Infinity Stone when the battle is over. Peter contacts the Nova Corps on Xander to alert them of Ronan's attack and also to let them know that the Ravengers will be helping protect the planet. Ronan's ship arrives at the planet Xander, along with a massive fleet of Kree fighter ships. While the Ravengers and the Nova Corps fight the fleet from the outside, Peter, Drax, Groot, and Gamora punch a hole in the Dark Aster and enter in on foot. Rocket, on the other hand, remains on the outside of the Dark Aster in order to help fight from his ship. The Guardians fight their way through the inside, defeating Nebula and Ronan's soldiers. Eventually, the Guardians reach Ronan, but Ronan, coupled with the power of the Infinity Stone, clearly has the upper hand. It seems as though all hope is lost for the Guardians. However, while monologuing about his superior power, Rocket crashes his ship through a window, hitting Ronan and causing the Dark Aster to fall out of the sky. As the Dark Aster is plummeting to Earth, Groot creates a protective wood ball around the group, which will kill him, but protect the others. After the ship crashes, a huge wave of destruction occurs, crushing buildings and a good portion of the city. The group has survived, except for Groot, but unfortunately, so did Ronan. Once again, Ronan, being the high and mighty fanatic, starts monologuing about how you will destroy Xander. Peter sees this as a great opportunity to create a distraction. Child, things will get brighter. Then bring it down hard. Someday, put it together. What are you together. doing? Dance off, bro. Me and you. Come on. Subtle, take it back. What are you doing? I'm distracting you, you big turd blossom. <laughs> Peter grabs the stone, and the Guardians all work together to utilize the power of the Infinity Stone, and finally defeat Ronan. Oh! You said it yourself, bitch. We're the Guardians of the Galaxy. After Ronan is destroyed, the Guardians trap the stone in a container, only to be immediately surrounded by Yandu and the Ravengers. Yandu takes the container and leaves the Guardians. As Yandu is leaving, he mentions to one of his crew how the Ravengers were originally hired to pick up Peter and bring Peter to his dad. This possibly could be a plot point for the next movie. Peter reveals, however, that he switched the container on Yandu, giving Yandu a troll doll while giving the real Infinity Stone to the Nova Corps to be locked away and protected. As a reward for their service, the Nova Corps expunges all of the Guardian's criminal records. Aboard the ship, we see that a small twig from Groot that Rocket had saved actually turned out to still be alive, indicating that we will most likely see Groot again. The Guardians fly off to start on some other new adventure. After the credits, on Nowhere, we see the Collector, still damaged and hurt from earlier, being taunted by Howard the Duck. The film opens with Aisha, the leader of the Sovereign Race, having the Guardians of the Galaxy protecting her valuable batteries from a massive monster, in exchange for Gamora's sister, Nebula, who was caught trying to steal the same batteries. However, 
Rocket steals some of the batteries for himself, and the Sovereign attacks the Guardian ship with a fleet of drones. The drones are destroyed by a mysterious ship, however, and they crash on a nearby planet. A man from the mysterious ship reveals himself to be Peter Quill's father, named Ego, and invites Quill, Gamora, and Drax to his home planet, while Rocket and Groot repair their ship and guard Nebula. Yondu and his crew are hired by the Sovereign to recapture the Guardians. Yondu and his crew have been kicked out of the Ravenger community for child trafficking, primarily referring to how he trafficked Peter as a child. They capture Rocket, but Yondu hesitates to turn over Quill, and then Yondu's lieutenant, Taserface, leads a mutiny with the help of Nebula. After succeeding, Taserface takes over, and Nebula leaves to find and kill her sister Gamora. Rocket and Yondu bond, and with the help of Groot and Kraglin, a Yondu loyalist, they are freed and destroy the ship, but Taserface is able to warn the Sovereign. We transition to find that Ego is a godlike being known as a Celestial, who manipulated matter around his consciousness to create a home planet. He also created a humanoid form where he can project his consciousness in order to travel the universe, and while doing so, he fell in love with Quill's mother Meredith, eventually leading to her pregnancy. Upon her death, Ego hired Yondu to collect Quill to bring him to the planet, but Quill was never delivered. Nebula arrives at Ego's planet to try to kill Gamora, but they come to an uneasy alliance once they discover a cave filled with skeletons. Ego then reveals to Quill that he actually planted seedlings across the world, which he can terraform into new extensions of himself, but can only be activated by two Celestials. He impregnated thousands of women, and had Yandu collect all of their offspring, in hopes that they would fulfill the role of the second Celestial. When they failed, Ego killed them, explaining the cave filled with skeletons. Under Ego's influence, Quill is forced to help him activate the seedlings, which begin to consume every world. But Quill fights back when Ego reveals that he actually killed Quill's mother due to the distraction that she posed. Mantis, Ego's empathic servant, grows close to Drax and warns him of Ego's plans. Gamora and Nebula learn of the plan as well, just as Rocket, Yondu, Groot, and Kraglin arrive. The Sovereign drones also pursue them, as the Guardians try to destroy Ego's brain housed in the planet's core. Rocket makes a bomb using the stolen Sovereign batteries, and Groot plants the bomb on the brain. Quill uses his newfound celestial powers against Ego to distract him long enough for the other Guardians and Mantis to escape. The bomb explodes, killing Ego and disintegrating the planet. Yandu sacrifices himself in order to save Quill, and Quill realizes that Yandu kept him hidden for so many years to protect him from being killed by Ego, and Quill accepts Yandu as his true father figure. Nebula chooses to leave and to try to kill her father, Thanos, by herself. The Guardians and several Ravenger groups have a funeral for Yandu, acknowledging his sacrifice and accepting him as a Ravenger again. In both the mid and end scene credits, we see several things, including Kraglin trying to use Yandu's telekinetic arrow, Ravenger leader Stakar Ogord reuniting with his ex-teammates, Groot starting to grow back to his normal size, acting like a stereotypical teenager, Aisha creating a new artificial being to destroy the Guardians named Adam, and lastly, Stan Lee talking to a group of Watchers about his experiences on Earth. Hello and welcome to another episode of Movie Spoiler Alerts. Today we are talking about the 2015 superhero film Ant-Man, so let's get started. In 1989, scientist Hank Pym resigns from S.H.I.E.L.D. after discovering their attempt to replicate his Ant-Man shrinking technology. Believing the technology is dangerous, Pym vows to hide it as long as he lives. In the present day, Pym's daughter, Hope Van Dyke, and former protege, Darren Cross, have forced him out of his company, Pym Technologies. Cross is close to perfecting a shrinking suit of his own, the Yellow Jacket, which horrifies Pym. Upon his release from prison, Scott Lang moves in with his old cellmate, Lewis. Lang visits his daughter and is chastised by his former wife and her police officer fiancé, Paxton, for not providing child support. Unable to hold a job, Lang agrees to join Lewis's crew. Lang breaks into a house and cracks its safe, but only finds what he believes to be an old motorcycle suit. After trying the suit on, Lang shrinks himself to the size of an insect. Terrified by the experience, he returns the suit to the house, but is arrested on the way out. Pim, the homeowner, visits Lang in jail and smuggles the suit into his cell to help him break out. Pym manipulated Lang through an unknowing Lewis into stealing the suit as a test, 
and wants Lang to become the new Ant-Man to steal the yellow jacket. Hope and Pym train Lang to fight and control ants. Pym warns Lang that he could disappear into a subatomic quantum realm, like his wife, the Wasp, did, if he overrides the suit's regulator. They send him to steal a device from the Avengers headquarters, where he briefly fights Sam Wilson. Cross perfects the yellow jacket and hosts an unveiling ceremony at Pym Technologies. Lang, along with the crew and a swarm of flying ants, infiltrate the building during the event, sabotage the company's servers, and plant explosives. When he attempts to steal the yellow jacket, they are all captured by Cross, who intends to sell both the yellow jacket and Ant-Man suits to Hydra. Lang and Hope break free to take out most of the Hydra agents, although one flees with a vial of Cross's particles and Pym is shot. Lang pursues Cross while the explosives detonate, imploding the building as Pym and Hope escape. Cross, wearing the yellow jacket, attacks Lang before Lang is arrested by Paxson. Cross takes Lang's daughter hostage to lure him into another fight. Lang overrides the regulator and shrinks to some atomic size to penetrate Cross's suit and sabotage it to shrink uncontrollably, killing Cross. Lang disappears into the quantum realm but manages to reverse the effects. Out of gratitude, Paxson covers for Lang to keep him out of prison. Seeing that Lang survived the quantum realm, Pym wonders if his wife is alive as well. Later, Lang meets up with Lewis, who tells him that Wilson is looking for him. In a mid credit scene, Pym shows Hope a new Wasp prototype suit and offers it to her. In a post credit scene, Wilson and Steve Rogers have Bucky Barnes in custody. Unable to contact Tony Stark because of the Accords, Wilson mentions that he knows someone who can help. The film opens in Nepal, where we see the sorcerer Kalius and his zealots entering into the secret compound, Kamar Taj, and they behead its librarian. They steal a few pages from an ancient text belonging to the Ancient One, a long-lived sorcerer who taught every student at Kamar Taj, including Kalius, in the mystic arts. The Ancient One pursues the traitors, but they escape. In New York, an acclaimed neurosurgeon, Stephen Strange, is badly injured in a car accident and is now unable to operate. Fellow surgeons and his former lover, Christine Palmer, try to convince him to move on, but Strange pursues experimental surgeries to heal his hands. Strange learns of a paraplegic man who mysteriously now has full use of his legs. Strange is directed to Kamar Taj, where he is taken in by Mordo, a sorcerer under the Ancient One. The Ancient One demonstrates her powers to Strange, revealing that there are a variety of dimensions, such as the Mirror Dimension. She agrees to train Strange, though his arrogance reminds her of Kalius. Strange excels very quickly, regaining use in his hands, studying under the Ancient One in Mordo, and reading ancient books from the library guarded by Master Wong. Strange learns that Earth is protected from other dimensions by three buildings called Sanctums, with their locations being in New York, London, and Hong Kong, all of which are accessible through Kamar Taj. It is the job of the sorcerers to protect the Sanctums. Strange reads from the same book that Kalius stole from, learning to bend time using the Eye of Agamotto. Mordo and Wong warn Strange against breaking the laws of nature, comparing it to Kalius' desire for eternal life. Kalius uses the stolen pages to contact a powerful being, Dormammu of the Dark Dimension, where time is non-existent. Kalius and his forces destroy the London Sanctum in order to weaken Earth's protection. They then attack the New York Sanctum, killing off its guardian, but Strange is able to hold them off using the Cloak of Levitation until Mordo and the Ancient One arrive. Mordo and Strange become disillusioned, however, by the Ancient One as they discover that she has been using forbidden magic from the Dark Dimension to give her eternal life. Kalius is able to mortally wound the Ancient One and escapes to Hong Kong. The Ancient One then tells Strange that he too will have to bend the laws of nature in order to defeat Kalius. Strange and Mordo arrive in Hong Kong to find Master Wong dead and the Sanctum destroyed, with the Dark Dimension taking over Earth. Strange uses the Eye of Agamotto to reverse time and is able to save Wong, and then Strange enters into the Dark Dimension to face Dormammu. He creates an infinite time loop with Dormammu, with Dormammu being unable to escape. After killing Strange several times and still unable to break the time loop, Dormammu agrees to leave Earth and take Kalius and his followers with him in order to break the time loop. Mordo is disgusted with Strange for breaking the laws of nature and leaves. Strange returns the Eye of Agamotto to Kamar Taj and moves to the New York Sanctum to continue his studies. In a mid credit scene, we see Strange helping Thor, who brought his brother Loki to Earth in order to search for their father Loden. 
The scene is actually directly from the new Thor Ragnarok film. In the post credit scene, we see Mordo confronting the former Paralyzed Man, stating that Earth has too many sorcerers, hinting that Mordo might become the next villain. Following the events of the first Avengers film, Adrian Toomes and his salvage company acquire alien technology, which they decide to make into illegal weapons. We transition to eight years later where we find Peter Parker, already having worked with the Avengers, now going to school and frustrated that he is not a full-time Avenger. Peter quits his school's academic decathlon team to focus on crime fighting as Spider-Man. One night, however, Peter's best friend Ned learns of Peter's secret identity. Peter also encounters Toomes' associate, Jackson Bryce, aka The Shocker, and Herman Schultz, who are selling weapons to a local criminal named Aaron Davis. Peter saves Davis when a fight breaks out, but Peter is attacked by Toomes who is in a large vulture-like flight suit, which is the classic Spider-Man villain, the Vulture. Peter is rescued by Tony Stark, who is monitoring the Spider-Man suit which Stark built, and warns against Peter getting involved with these criminals anymore. Later, Toomes kills Bryce, and Schultz becomes the new Shocker. Peter and Ned study the weapon left behind by Toomes' crew and remove its power core. Peter is able to track the criminals to Maryland, so he hitches a ride with his decathlon team, which are traveling to Washington, D.C. for their tournament. Peter and Ned are able to disable the Spider-Man suit's tracker and enable the suit's more advanced features. Peter tries to stop Toomes from stealing from a weapons convoy, but is trapped inside one of the trucks and is locked in a secure facility for the night, which causes him to miss the decathlon tournament. Peter discovers that the power core that Ned is still carrying has become unstable and leads to the whole decathlon being trapped in an elevator when the core explodes. Peter rushes in and saves his classmate, including his crush, Liz. Back in New York City, Peter meets with the criminal, Davis, that was seen earlier to find out Toomes' location. He arrives on the Staten Island Ferry, and Peter attempts to stop Toomes, but the ferry is cut in half when a weapon malfunctions, and Toomes escapes. Stark arrives to save the passenger, and then berates Peter for his actions, and takes his suit. Peter returns to school, and asks Liz to come with him to the homecoming dance. On the night of the dance, he learns that Liz's dad is Toomes. Toomes figures out that Peter is really Spider-Man and threatens Peter if he tries to intervene with his plans. Peter realizes that Toomes plans to attack the plane transporting weapons from the Avengers Tower. Peter dons his homemade Spider-Man suit and intercepts the plane while fighting Toomes, and it crashes on a beach. They continue fighting, Peter saves Toomes' life from a deadly explosion, and then ties up Toomes for the police to find him. After her father's arrest, Liz moves away, and Peter declines an invitation to become a full-time Avenger in favor of being a student and a neighborhood superhero. We also find out that one of his classmates, who's been teasing him throughout the film, actually goes by the nickname MJ, hinting at a possible girlfriend and love interest. Stark also gives Peter back his suit, which Aunt May walks in just as he's putting on, discovering Peter's superhero identity. In a mid credit scene, we see Toomes in prison, being questioned about Spider-Man's real identity, but Toomes denies knowing anything about his secret. To get started, let's do a quick rundown of the Avengers team. Tony Stark, aka Iron Man. He's a billionaire genius that has no actual powers, but incredibly advanced technology that helps him fight bad guys. Thor, aka Pretty Boy. From Asgard, the God of Thunder, who carries a hammer that cannot be moved. Bruce Banner, a.k.a. The Hulk, a scientist that when he gets angry becomes a massive green creature that is nearly invincible. Steve Rogers, a.k.a. Captain America, a genetically enhanced man from the 1940s that was frozen for 70 years and is sometimes a bit of out of touch with modern times. Clint Barton, a.k.a. Hawkeye, a new character to the modern Marvel movie universe who does not have his own individual movie and frankly, no one really cares about him. Hawkeye's weapon of choice is a bow and arrow, but does not have any real specific superpowers. Natasha Romanoff, aka Black Widow. Honestly, save for maybe pretty boy Thor, she's the best looking member of the Avengers. She also does not have her own movie, but I'd definitely watch it if she did. She's a highly trained former Soviet spy who is a master assassin and seductress. Nick Fury. While not an actual Avenger, he is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., an organization that is sort of like a souped-up CIA that sometimes uses superheroes. The Avengers work as a part of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now that we've explained who is part of the team, let's get to the story. The movie begins with Thor's not-so-nice brother, Loki. 
Loki meets a character called The Other, who is the leader of an alien race known as the Chitari. If Loki gets an object called the Tesseract from S.H.I.E.L.D. and gives it to The Other, The Other will give Loki an army capable of taking over Earth. The Tesseract has been seen in quite a few other Marvel movies, especially in the first Captain America movie. I will be doing a summary of those movies explaining the history a bit more, so make sure to check them out. The Tesseract is an Infinity Stone. For more in-depth explanation of what Infinity Stones are, check out my Guardians of the Galaxy movie summary. The main thing to know about the Tesseract is it's a cube of great power, and the other wants it, so he can give it to his master, Thanos. Nearly all of the recent Marvel movies, at least on some level, have been influenced by Thanos. While we only have seen glimpses of him, Thanos is going to be playing a big role in the future, and his desire to get his hands on the Infinity Stones is very important. Loki breaks into the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters and ends up capturing the Tesseract, as well as mind-controlling a good amount of S.H.I.E.L.D. scientists, including Dr. Eric Selvig, the professor from the Thor movies, as well as Hawkeye. Nick Fury escapes this attack and works to get the Avengers together, which does take a bit of convincing. The mind-controlled Hawkeye ends up stealing Iridium that is needed to stabilize the Tesseract, while at the same time, Loki makes a very loud and obvious distraction. Loki is captured by the Avengers and taken to S.H.I.E.L.D.'s ship, known as the Helicarrier. However, the Tesseract is still hidden away from the Avengers. After some investigating, the Avengers learn that S.H.I.E.L.D. wants the Tesseract Cube so they can weaponize it, which starts a big argument between the agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the members of the Avengers. While arguing, the mind-controlled Hawkeye and several others of Loki's crew attack the helicarrier. A big fight breaks out, Loki escapes, and Hawkeye is knocked unconscious, which breaks him from his mind control. The Avengers attempt to recover, while Loki puts the final parts of his plan into action. The still mind-controlled Dr. Selvig has set up the Tesseract on the roof of a building in New York City, which he uses to open a massive wormhole. From the wormhole, a giant army of Chitari pours in, the same army that the other promised to Loki for capturing the Tesseract. A huge fight breaks out between Loki's army and the Avengers. The US government attempts to use a nuclear missile to destroy the whole city of New York in order to prevent the attack from spreading. But Iron Man takes the missile through the wormhole, causing it to detonate on the other side in a galaxy far away. The explosion causes the wormhole to close, and Iron Man falls back to Earth. Loki is defeated, in a rather brutal way by the Hulk, and then Thor takes both Loki and the Tesseract back to Asgard. The film opens with the Avengers raiding a Hydra facility in Sokovia, commanded by Baron Wolfgang von Strucker, who has been experimenting on humans using the scepter previously wielded by Loki. They encounter test subjects Pietro and Wanda Maximoff, who are Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, as well as apprehending Strucker and Loki's scepter. As a quick side note, these are actually the kids of Magneto from the X-Men universe, but due to licensing issues, they cannot refer to this. Stark and Banner, the Hulk, discover an artificial intelligence within the scepter's gem and secretly use it to complete Stark's Ultron Global Defense Program. It creates a sentient being who believes he must eradicate humanity to save Earth. It destroys Stark's AI Jarvis and attacks the Avengers at their headquarters. Ultron escapes with the Scepter and uses the resources at the Hydra base to upgrade his body and build an army of robot drones. Having killed Strucker, he recruits the Maximoff siblings and sets off to obtain Ronkonda Vibranium. The Avengers arrive and attack Ultron, but the Scarlet Witch subdues them with haunting visions. The team goes into hiding at a safe house, reeling from the visions. Thor departs to consult Dr. Eric Selvig on the meaning of the apocalyptic future he saw in his hallucination. Nick Fury arrives and encourages the rest of the team not to break apart and to form a plan to stop Ultron. Meanwhile, Ultron forces the team's friend Dr. Helen Cho to use her synthetic tissue technology, together with the vibranium and the scepter's gem, to perfect a new body for him. As Ultron uploads himself into the body, the Scarlet Witch reads his mind. Discovering his plan for human extinction, the Maximoff siblings turn against Ultron. Some of the team find Ultron and retrieve the synthetic body, but Ultron captures Black Widow. The team fight amongst themselves while Stark secretly uploads Jarvis, who hid from Ultron inside the internet, into the synthetic body. 
Thor returns to help activate the body, explaining that the gem on its brow is one of the six infinity stones, and was part of his vision. This vision and the Maximoff siblings accompany the Avengers' return to Sokovia, where Ultron has used the remaining vibranium to build a machine to lift a large part of the capital skyward, intending to crash it into the ground to cause global extinction. Banner rescues Black Widow while the Avengers fight Ultron's army. Fury and others evacuate civilians. Quicksilver dies when he shields Hawkeye from gunfire, and a vengeful Scarlet Witch abandons her post to destroy Ultron's primary body, which allows one of his drones to activate the machine. The city plummets, but Stark and Thor overload the machine and shatter the landmass. In the aftermath, the Hulk departs while the Vision confronts Ultron's last remaining body. Later, the Avengers establish a new base, Thor returns to Asgard, Stark leaves, Hawkeye retires, and Captain America with Black Widow prepare to train new Avengers. In a mid credit scene, we see Thanos vow to retrieve the Infinity Stones for himself, hinting at the next Avengers film. So that was the spoilers for all the Marvel films up to Infinity War. If you have another film you'd like to see me spoil, please let me know in the comments below. Check out movie spoiler alerts on our various forms of social media, and check out our Avengers giveaway on Instagram. Thanks for watching.